the roots of the cross reach back before creation into the Godhead from all eternity where the Father and the Son have infinitely loved each other forever and ever and ever. And that love between the Father and the Son, Jesus says, is why He's doing what He's doing. I want the world to see and know I love the Father. That's amazing. The deepest roots of our salvation is the Son's love for the Father and the Father's love for the Son, which existed for all eternity. Now, with that foundation in place, let's turn to faith and joy and peace. The foundation for all of them is that Satan is not sovereign on the night of Jesus' death. Love is sovereign. This is a death designed by love. We sang that as well. Love by death. I love to sing the truth. Faith. Now I have told, this is verse 29. Now, I told you before it takes place so that when it does take place, you may believe. And he said this before, right? Chapter 13, verse 19. I'm telling you this. He's referring to Judas's betrayal this time. I'm telling you this now before it takes place so that when it does take place, you may believe that I am He. So, in addition to suffering all that he suffers and doing all that he does, all of which is intended to awaken faith, he predicts it before it happens also to awaken faith. That's what he says. I'm telling you this, verse 29, before it takes place so that when it does, you may believe. You see how he's helping us? I'm going to die for you. That should awaken your faith. I'm going to suffer willingly. That should awaken your faith. I'm going to tread on Satan's neck, that should awaken your faith. But I'll add to that, I'm going to tell you ahead of time everything that's happening so that you will be doubly blown away and have something to trust. He's just helping us. There are doubters in the midst. Thomas is there. Thomas is there. He's willing to give more than they need or some need. Blessed are you who believe without having seen. But if you need to see, Thomas, I'll give you my side. We have a Savior who goes the extra mile so many times in our lives. So he's working before he dies for their faith in his death. The point of prediction, I mean, what's the point of prediction? Surely the point of prediction is who's in charge? Right? If, you're, if, you're, if before everything that happens to you, you tell people this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, they're going to start to get the impression, wow, you're incredible. You know, you either have a, you know, a hotline to the future or I think you may be in charge of the future. <laughs> Which is true. So here's the application for you. If if in history's darkest hour, the cross, if in history's darkest hour it was true that Satan and evil did not have the upper hand, but God had the upper hand for your good, then in your darkest hour, that's true also. So add this to your arsenal of faith in Romans eight twenty eight. On the night, as the darkness closed in, Jesus said, it's not in charge. My love is in charge. And as your darkness closes in, get in its face and say, you're not in charge. My God is in charge. Now, that leads us, doesn't it, to want to think about joy in that moment, peace in that moment. So let's move from trusting a sovereign God in the death of Jesus over Satan to joy. Verse 28, you heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced. There's joy. You would have rejoiced. You should be rejoicing because 
I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. So there's an argument there, isn't there? There's an argument with some premises and some conclusions. So what's the argument? Here's the argument. Premise, the Father is greater than I. What does that mean? I think two things. One, during His incarnation, the Father is greater in glory and greater in exaltation because Jesus has humbled Himself, taken on human form to serve and to suffer, and in that season, the Father in His supreme, unadulterated glory was greater than Jesus. Here's the second meaning I think it has. From all eternity, the Father has been the one who begets the Son. Very hard for us to grasp this, an eternal begetting. No beginning. Jesus had no beginning. There never was when Jesus was not. That's heresy. It's called Arianism. And the church fought profoundly for a century to end that one. Jesus has always been, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And through Him all things were made, but He was begotten. He was a Son. He was imaged. He is a radiance from an original which has always been radiating from the original with such fullness, He is of one nature with the original. This is heavy. This is the Trinity. This is a great and glorious reality. And there's nothing in this statement that the Father is greater that questions the deity of Jesus and His full divine quality of equal essence. So, the premise is the Father is greater than the Son. He is the one who, according to Hebrews 1, 3, has a radiance in the Son and an, an exact imprint in the Son. But He is the one who has the exact imprint. He is not the imprint. The Father is not the imprint. The Father is not the radiance. And since Jesus has that relationship to the Father, you should rejoice when He goes to the Father. You should be glad when He has a more immediate experience of intimacy with the Father as He moves back into His prior glory. We should be glad in the gladness of the Son in the Father. Does that make sense? Jesus is saying, I'm going to the Father. I'm closing in on again in a fuller intimacy that I had from all eternity with a, a union of glory that is my joy from all eternity. Would your joy not be in my joy in God the Father? If you loved me, you would have rejoiced that I am going to the Father, which means our joy is not the joy that the world gives. He said it about peace explicitly. He means it about joy implicitly. Not as the world gives do I give to you joy. Oh, how different is the foundation of your joy than the world's joy. Infinitely different. 
Because your joy is joy in the joy of the Son, in the Father. Your joy is being caught up into and participating in the joy that the Father has in the Son and the Son has in the Father. I'm returning to my Father. I love my Father. I find satisfaction in my Father. I delight in my Father. I treasure my Father. This is a Vesuvius of joy that is closing now. Would you not partake? The world knows nothing of this. Nothing. Our joy has infinite roots. It is a participation in the very joy of God in God. And mark this. Remember, verse 31. God showed this love between the Father and the Son most clearly at the cross. Let's read verse 31. I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. We see the love of the Son for the Father in the death of the Son for sinners so that they can participate in the love of the Son for the Father and the joy between the Son and the Father. That's the essence of salvation. To draw us out of all lesser joys and bring us into an experience of the very joy of the Son for the Father and the Father for the Son. There isn't a greater joy. There isn't a greater love than that. And I'm showing it to you now. I want the whole world to know this. I want the world to know that I love the Father. That's why I'm dying Wouldn't you rejoice? For the joy set before me, I endure the cross. Hebrews 12, 2. What joy? This joy. I love my Father. I'm going home. Wouldn't you rejoice with me in that? Yes, you would. If you understood, you would. That's why I'm teaching you all things, John, from these decades later. Here's the practical meaning of that. Going to bed tonight, okay? Here's what you do. As you get in bed, you say, Father, I praise you for the love that exists between you and your son Jesus. Let's praise you that you love each other. So good thankful that you've revealed to me the love between the Father and the Son in the Trinity, in the Godhead. I praise you for the joy that you have in each other. So I'm mentioning love and I'm mentioning joy. You love each other, you delight in each other, and I praise you that you are that way. And I realize, because what Pastor John pointed out in verse 31, I realize that this love and this joy is the reason Jesus endured the cross. Because he said he wanted the whole world to know how much he loved the Father as he was dying. That's what he wants them to know. So I realize that this love between you and the Son carried him through the cross for my sin to bring me up out of my little tiny world of selfishness and groveling around in this world trying to find some satisfaction. You did that for me and therefore my forgiveness, my righteousness... My life utterly depends on this love between you and your, your son, Father, and I am glad. I am glad in your gladness in Jesus and his in you, and I thank you for giving me a taste of it. Amen. Good night, Jesus. See you in the morning while I go total, totally unconscious like a little helpless baby all night long, and you can be God for me. Finally, peace. We've talked about faith, we've talked about joy, and now we're talking about peace. Verse 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So in the last hour of his life, he's helping you not be anxious. 
Let not your heart be troubled. The peace he has in mind might include, you know, global, national, political, intra-ethnic, inter-ethnic peace. It might. It's not, it's not at the front of his mind, though, and I know it isn't because of what he says. He says, peace I live with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your hearts be troubled. That's what he has in mind. Of course, there are a thousand fruits. This is the root of a new world order. But on his mind is, you look troubled. Your faces look troubled. I love you. I don't like it when you look that way. I don't want to leave you that way. It's that simple. It's that precious. It's that personal. It is. He says, heart. Heart. Don't let your heart, not your globe, don't let your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I want you to be fearless, Peter. I want you to be a rock. Not as the world gives to you. How does the world give peace? It does. It does. The world gives peace with retirement accounts. The world gives peace with health insurance. The world gives peace with bomb shelters. The world gives peace with safety nets in the society. The world gives peace with police. The world gives peace of mind in a hundred ways, which I'm thankful for. I'm glad they exist. And he says, I'm not giving that way. I'm just not, that's not what I'm doing. What do you mean, Jesus? You're not... You're not doing it that way. What, what do you mean? I'm, I'm not giving you the kind of peace that can be taken away when the police go away. I'm not giving you the kind of peace that can be taken away in India, no matter what. I, I'm not giving, that is not what I'm about. Now, how do I know that he means that? That, that the world's peace of mind is circumstantially based. Right? Get enough health insurance get enough retirement account, live in the right neighborhood, get the right locks on your doors, and, uh, and then have some peace of mind. And, and that's not what I'm giving you, not as the world gives to you, do I give to you. I'm giving you peace so that when the locks come off, the police go away, the mob comes, and your cross is on the horizon, you've still got it. So now how do I know that? I, I know it because in chapter 16, verse 33, he says the same thing, only he makes it explicit. Chapter 16, verse 33, the text I used at Tom Steller's wedding 35 years ago. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation, but take heart. That is, take heart in that tribulation. I have overcome the world. The peace that Jesus gives is not circumstantially based. It is peace in bad circumstances, in tribulation, in no health insurance, and in police breakdown and societal breakdown. It's in these things where our peace, the peace that passes all human comprehension. Now, why did Paul call it that? That's, that's Philippians 4, 7. Peace that passes understanding. What, what does that mean? That means human beings can't grasp it and they can't make it happen. God makes it happen. Now, does he give us any clue as to how? Yes, he does. He calls it my peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I gave you my joy. My joy meaning I love the Father. I delight in the Father. The Father loves me. Come on in and have our love, our joy. Same thing here. I have a peace with the Father that is unrivaled. 
Jesus says, my peace is unrivaled in the universe. Would you like some of mine? Come on in. How, how do you get in? How do you get into the peace that Jesus enjoys with the Father? There's no sin between the Son and the Father. The Son looks on the Father and he sees infinite original righteousness. The Father looks on the Son and says, infinite reflected righteousness. And oh, they love each other infinitely. They delight in what they see. How are you going to get in on that? Because he says, let us go. I'm going to the cross tomorrow. And what I'm going to do at the cross tomorrow is I'm going to purchase your forgiveness. I'm going to satisfy the Father's wrath against all your unrighteousness. And I'm going to provide a completed righteousness so that if you would rest in me, trust me, you will now not just have a peace that I make, but a peace that I have with my Father. I'm making a way for you in, in, to the very experience by the Spirit reigning in your heart, pouring out the peace that exists between the Father and the Son. I'm going to pour it out into your life so that now you will have my faith and my joy and my peace. I tell you, Bethlehem, we have a great Savior and a great salvation. Closing exhortation. Right now, right now, in every service, receive Jesus' faith. Jesus was totally confident in His Father, in His cross work, that Satan would be defeated, and all His saving work would be accomplished, and He invites you. I'm showing these things to you so that you can Believe with me and receive his joy, his joy. And he displayed his joy most fully by enduring the cross to show the world, I love the Father that much. I'm satisfied that much in the Father. And you can come on in to this infinite, this Vesuvius, this volcanic love between the Son and the Father. Come on in, receive this. Bethlehem. Spend, spend the rest of your life swimming in this ocean. If this sounds unusual to you, like you've never even heard anybody talk about inviting you into the very love that the Son has for the Father, the joy between them, the peace between them, just enjoy the next 30 years of discovery. It's very deep. It's worthy of all your life. Don't, don't walk out here saying, oh, that's heavy. They do heavy stuff in Bethlehem. Blah, blah, blah. We don't do heavy stuff. We swim. We just frolic in mystery. Talk about it a little bit. Nobody knows anything. You know what I mean. Comparatively. And receive His peace. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Don't let your heart be troubled, Bethlehem. Don't let it be afraid. Trust Him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for Christ. I love Christ. I love salvation. I love the Gospels. I love your Word. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy might be in you and that your joy might be full. We could have gone there. The riches of this is, are endless. The heights are out of sight and we'll never get to the top of it. The depths are bottomless and we'll never get to the bottom of it. We will spend eternity walking in the fields of glory. So, get us started. And give us such satisfaction in our communion with you that we would cry out, give me a thousand tongues to sing your praise. Give me a thousand tongues to tell of your greatness in this world. Make me 
part of the roots of a new world order. Pray this in Jesus' name.